Yep, little green lights on. Well, one more Sunday where Jim had to put big boy pants on and a shirt with a collar and come up here and, and preach. Um, I try to avoid that like the plague. Uh, I retired from the library a little over a year ago and I almost threw all my shirts with collars away because I hated them. But for you guys, for God, I put one on. Um, obviously people are on vacation. Pastor Ron is not here, so I get to fill in for him. Uh, my, my sermon here today says I need to start with good morning, everyone. So good morning, everybody. How are we doing? All right. I just want to say I've never been applauded for giving an announcement, so I really appreciate all of you who clapped for that. Uh, it made me feel really good. Um, normally I get applauded for tripping and falling or something along those lines. I hope everyone today is awake and alert, that you're ready, that you're paying attention and everything is going on. Because if you're not, this is the opportunity for you to tilt your head back, start snoring, and relax. The rest of us will absolutely enjoy it as we take out our phones and video you and watch you at dinner later on. So keep that in mind. On a serious note though, my sermon today is going to continue with the theme of prayer. Um, I'm going to take my glasses off so I can read this better. <laughs> As I said last week, Pastor Ron just finished his series on Acts, uh, and that's the components of prayer. Anybody remember what those stood for? Way to go. Very good. You guys paid attention. I am proud of you. Um, last week, I spoke about what prayer does to you as an individual when you use it and you enter into prayer. Today, I'm going to issue a call to prayer to us, for us as a church. And I'm going to talk about what a call to prayer means. And I'm going to talk a little bit about what the components that we need as a church when we enter into corporate prayer. As a church, we do a lot. We minister to our community through a food bank, missions projects, um, school lunch pro or uh, summer lunch program, and just a general attitude of how can we help. We fellowship together better than any group or church that I've ever seen. We do discipleship. We have Master Life. We have our Wednesday night program. We have our small group studies. We have praise and praise from Wednesday night. We have our Sunday morning worship time. We go out of our way to tell people about Jesus that he's the reason why we're doing all of these things. Individually, we pray about our friends, our families, what we're doing, what we're involved in. However, I think we forget about the corporate side of prayer. And what is that you wanna know? It's when we gather together in one body and we have a singular focus on what we're praying about. Yes, we pray as a church on Sunday morning during the worship service, Yes, we pray on Wednesday night. During the opening times, we pray at our Bible studies as a group. But during that time, do we have a real singular focus on what we're praying about? Or are our minds wandering around thinking about what's for lunch? Is that weather gonna hold out? I wanna go fishing tonight. I got some chores to do around the house before I can get anything done or whatever else happens to fly through our minds, when we really should be focused on what is happening immediately in front of us. I'm gonna tell you, as somebody who has a little bit of ADHD, or a lot depending on who you talk to, it's hard for me to focus sometimes. And I think, as a church, sometimes we have a little bit of ADHD going on. Because as I sit and I look, I sometimes think our minds are wandering. We all have our projects that we're concerned with that we want to make sure are taken care of in prayer. So we concentrate there. Then we throw a backhanded prayer at what someone else is concerned with. I believe that's wrong. If we're going to pray about it, we need to be focused on it. When we are together as a church, we need to be of one mind, singularly focused. Acts 2.1, in the King James Version, 
because I really like the joke that's going to come after this. But Acts 2.1 in the King James Version says, And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. They were of one accord. I've got to tell you, it doesn't mean they were all in a Honda. All right? I love that joke. It's really bad, but I can't resist it. They were in agreement. They were together. They were praying for the same thing. By the way, that's the first point of the message today. When we have a call to prayer and we come together as a body in the church, we need to be focused. We need to pray and we need to be in agreement about those prayers, about what we are praying for. Before I go any further, I want us to pray together and in one accord that God blesses the message that we have, but that he also moves us closer to him. So if you all would close your eyes and let's pray. Father, as we're here now, as this message that you've given to me, as I prepared it and I wrote it, and you gave me the words to say, I pray that it reaches out and touches the people here, that your words that you gave me will help us to become better people, better men and women who are in service to you, that it will bring us closer to you as Christians, that we will recognize that you are God and that you are holy and that you are in charge of our lives and that we are here to serve you, to praise you and worship you. And I just pray this now in Christ's name, amen. Today I'm going to tell a story, and it's based out of 2 Chronicles chapter 20. It's at a point in time in history of the Jewish people where the nation of Israel has been divided into two parts, the nation of Judah and the nation of Israel. In Israel, they chose to follow pagan gods, and they relegated the god of their forefathers into a back row seat. They threw him a, praise God, every once in a while, but they were busy following Baal and Asherah. In Judah, they had a similar time of pagan worship, but King Jehoshaphat, when he took over, put an end to that. And he returned them to worshiping the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and to give him praise and honor. And after restoring that nation of Judah, Jehoshaphat set up judges to help govern over the people and to rule justly. And during this time, three armies got together, joined forces, and decided to invade Judah, and they wanted to destroy it. Jehoshaphat, his response was simple, like anybody else who's being invaded by three armies. He was afraid. He didn't know what to do. Then he had the thought, you know what? I'm going to call on the people to fast and to gather together and pray. Second Chronicles chapter 20, verses 3 and 4 says... Then Jehoshaphat was afraid and set his face to seek the Lord and proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. And Judah assembled to seek help from the Lord from all the cities of Judah. They came to seek the Lord. Here we're getting to my second point. When praying, we must focus on why we are praying. You see, with the calling to fast and gather together, you see that. First of all, I want to cover fasting. Let's be honest with each other. None of us particularly likes the idea of fasting. Going without food. Come on, I love food. Not that you can tell right now, but I love food. I love to eat. I'm willing to be, bet that most of you out here really love to eat also, right? This is yes. Okay. Um, the desire for food, though, can be a distraction from God. And that's one of the reasons why we see fasting um, is referred to in the Bible as much as it is. Now, I fasted before, and not for a long time or a prolonged time. I've never done it for more than 48 hours. Two days without food, to me, is an eternity. Um, but somewhere in that second day, I start to stop worrying about the food. And I start to focus 
on why I'm doing that and why I wanted to start fasting and what will help me get through that fast. And you know, that's God. See, fasting helps me to focus on God and my need for his help. In the same respect, the people of Judah also put aside all of their daily tasks and they chose to assemble together. They didn't come from just one town and get together. They came from all the towns. You go back to uh, verse 4 of 2 Chronicles 20, and it says, From all the cities of Judah they came to seek the Lord. From all of them. They didn't worry about who was going to plant their field or harvest their crop. They didn't worry about who was going to clean the house. They didn't care about who was going to take care of their business. They chose to answer the call to prayer, to join together, to fast. They heard that call from Jehoshaphat to seek God and to make him the first priority in their lives. And they gathered together to seek him through prayer. My question for you guys, are you willing to put away all those things and those distractions that you have in your life? I mean, I hope so. It's not easy to do. Uh, I'll be the first to admit it. I got all kinds of things going on. It's not easy to set everything aside and say, I'm going to focus. But at some point in our lives, every one of us, we're going to need to make him first, meaning God. At some point in our lives, that has to happen. And I think it needs to start now for all of us. Jeremiah 29, 13 says, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. Think about that. You want to find God, you want to seek him, you seek him with all your heart. Be singularly focused. I'm going to continue the story. Jehoshaphat led them in prayer. They were in agreement with that prayer and they were focused on it. And in his prayer, Jehoshaphat follows the Acts theme. He praises God. He confesses everything that God has given to them. He thanks him for it. He shares their problem with God. And then something amazing happened. God answered in a bold and powerful way. The Holy Spirit touched a young Levite who gave God's answer to that prayer. He said, don't be afraid. This is the synopsis. This is the gym version of God's answer. Don't be afraid. I've got this. In other words, quit worrying. This is my fight, not yours. And I'm going to take care of it. What I want you to do is gather yourselves up, go down amongst the enemy, and see what I do. He even tells them where the enemy is going to be. Where they're camping at. And he tells them, you're not going to have to fight. You just show up and see what I do. Because I'm going to do the work, and I'm going to be with you. So the people of Judah did what any follower of God would do after that answer to a prayer. They praised God. Brings me to my third point today. After you get God's answer to your prayer, you need to praise him. Whether you like the answer or not, you still need to praise God because he is God. Simply because he is God, he is worthy of our praise. He deserves it, and we need to give it to him. Not because he answered the way that we might want him to, but simply because he is God. We talk about this a lot here uh, at Cobb. At least I know uh, the pastors, when we talk a lot of times, we talk about the fact that we need to praise God simply because he is God. I hope you guys do that too when you get together. Let's start doing it more often. Instead of just when we're together as a church, maybe when we get together as a little group of friends, maybe when we're by ourselves, maybe when we're at work, all the time we need to praise God and give him thanks. I mean, my life has changed in this past year in some pretty dramatic ways. And God has done some pretty amazing things to me. And, and what I've realized is that I need to praise him more and give him more thanks. And so I continue to do that. 
Don't miss an opportunity to give God praise. Do it in front of the people at church. Do it in front of your neighbors. Do it in front of your coworkers, friends. Do it in front of strangers. It's important. People will notice. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 6 and 7 talks about praising God no matter what. In this you rejoice, though now for a little while, if necessary, you've been grieved by various trials, so that the tested geniusness of your faith, more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Next part of my story I'm going to go into is they gathered up themselves, the army, a band, and they went to see what God did. In the meantime, God began his work in those three armies. He convinced two sides of those armies to attack the third side and wipe them out. When that third army was wiped out, the two sides that gathered together to attack them decided they had a beef. God caused problems between them, and they ended up wiping themselves out. Annihilated. Gone. So here comes Jehoshaphat, his army, his band, coming down into the valley, playing music, praising God, and they find all the invaders dead by their own hands, or more importantly, by God's doing. So Judah, Jehoshaphat, his army, and the band, began to collect the spoils of war because God said, you can have them. You can have all of it. I want you to see what I did, and I want you to praise me for it. So many spoils did they find, in fact, they couldn't carry them all. In fact, it took them three days to gather it all up. Now imagine that for yourself. Imagine that for this church. We get to collect the enemy's riches after our God, the one true God, fought our battle because we chose to pray as a group of singular mind, being focused, and we chose to praise him. I want you to think about that. I want you to think about what those spoils of war can be because I'm going to talk about them in a moment. My fourth point here is simple. When you answer the call to prayer, don't be afraid to accept God's gifts. Sometimes we don't want to accept what God gives us after we accept his answers. He's going to defeat our enemies, and he's going to give us a prize. He's going to give us the gift of the spoils of war. Now, I don't mean we're going to get all the gold and silver and all the expensive stuff, and we're going to be able to take it home and put it up in a little trophy rack. It's not what I'm talking about. You're going to get God's gifts. We need to accept them. He's choosing to give them to us. Who are we to say to him, no? Doesn't mean that we take it and go, look what God gave me. Ha, 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 ha. I got this. You didn't. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about saying God gave this to me and praising him for what he did. The greatest gift that God gives us is not money, it's not silver, it's not gold, it's not new cars, it's not a new house, it's not a brand new job. The greatest gift God gives us is salvation. When we pray that most important prayer, asking for Jesus to be our Savior, we are given the gift of salvation from God. Ephesians 2.8 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. Accept the gift. Take it up proudly and live for the one who gave you that gift. Finally, the story ends with the fear of God coming to all the kingdoms who heard that the one true God chose to fight for his people. The fear that was on Jehoshaphat and Judah at the beginning was now on the kingdoms around them because God chose to fight for them. It all happened because the people of Judah answered the call to prayer by their king. I want you to imagine our pastor calling us to pray. And in that prayer, we heap adoration upon God with us in total agreement with him. 
No distractions. Nothing else going through our mind. Then our pastor confesses our sins as a corporate body. Our shortcomings, the things that we have done wrong, our doubts. He shares all those with God and we are in agreement with him. And he seeks God's forgiveness with us in total agreement with no distractions. He thanks God for what God has done for us already, for what we know God is going to do for us. And we are in total agreement with him. And we don't have any distractions. Then asking God to prepare the hearts of sinners in our community to hear the gospel and to give us the courage to share it with us in a total agreement with no distractions. What do you think would happen? I can't say for sure, but I believe uh, we could shake the foundations of this city. That we could change our neighborhoods, our workplaces, our own homes. So today, I want to call all of you together for prayer. And the prayer is going to be very simple. The focus is the need for Jesus to be shared in everything we do as members of God's church, as members of Church on the Boulevard here. More importantly, for Jesus to be shared in everything we do as individuals. I don't know about you, but I want to see a world where they all get to hear Christ. They all get to hear the message of salvation. They get to hear about Jesus, his death, his resurrection, and the freedom it gives to each and every person who accepts him as their savior. John 9, 31, there's a blind man who's been healed by Christ, who's being questioned by the Sanhedrin. And he makes this statement. We know that God does not listen to sinners, but if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, God listens to him. There's a fair warning right here that we need to be of a clean heart and sin-free when we come to God in prayer. We don't need to be hanging on to those little things. Oh, this is mine. I like this one. I'm going to put it in my pocket, and after we're done with the prayer, I'm going to take it back out and look at it some more. We, we don't need that. We need to put those sins away. We need to ask for forgiveness for them because they will hold us back. They will keep God from hearing what we have to say. You want to shake the world, you need to ask according to his will. You want to do what God wants, you need to find what he wants. It means asking God to help you do the tasks he's given you. 1 John 5, 14 says, And this is the confidence that we have toward him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. Think about that one. The last thing I want to say before we pray is you can do this on your own, and we can do this together. I believe we're called to be together as Christians, as a church body, and to work together for what God's called us all to do. To encourage one another, to push each other to do what God wants. Hebrews 10, 24, and 25 talks about this. Let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Well, every day the day draws near, let me tell you. Every day we go by, the day is drawing near. So we need to start encouraging one another. We need to consider how to get each other moving. To do good works and to show love. Not neglecting to get together. Encouraging one another. Because every day gets us one day closer to Christ coming back. I want to finish this morning with a call to prayer, asking God to guide us to people who need Christ and to give us the courage and strength to share it. And I hope you join me in this prayer. Let's close our eyes. Dear Heavenly Father, you are one amazing, awesome God. The things you have done for me, for our church, bringing us together, keeping us safe, healing our sick, I don't have the right words to say all the things that you have done, God. 
but I thank you for them. Because without you, they would never have been done. We have many things that we do wrong. We wander off. We allow the world to keep us distracted and busy. Forgive us for those things. We have our secret sins that we hide from everyone else. Forgive us for those. Help take them away. We thank you because you are God. We thank you for all that you've done in our lives up to this point. And we have a simple prayer, God. The world around us is full of people who don't know Christ as their Savior. Lead us to them. Let your spirit go out and touch their hearts now, preparing them to hear about Jesus. Let us have courage and strength to say and do the things that we need to say and do to share Christ with them. Knowing that whether they choose to accept Christ as their Savior or not, they're not rejecting us, they're rejecting you if they say no. And if they say yes, they're not accepting us, they're accepting you. Help us to be the men and women that you call us to be as your church, loving and compassionate, sharing Christ in everything. And I just pray this in Christ's name. Amen. If you'd all please stand, we're going to close the uh, this part of the service with uh, hymn number 625, the doxology. <laughs>